Well, thank you very much and welcome everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person or actually most of us be there in person. So what I'm gonna, what I was asked to do today is talk about um, marijuana for epilepsy. So this is kind of a very broad topic. There is a lot of, there's one FDA approved product called Epidiolex and I'm gonna to talk to you about that mostly because Though that's where the strongest evidence is in terms of clinical trials, placebo controlled trials. But there's lots of obviously other options and I'm gonna to try to cover that. And obviously the, the options that you have probably depends on where you live. So for example, the options for people in Ohio are probably different than California and different than Oregon and different than Texas. So I'm gonna to try to go over that a little bit but I obviously couldn't put everything about every state regulations about every state, but hopefully there'll be some information that can help you um, or your loved one uh, get through and understand what CBD and marijuana can do for epilepsy. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, oh, just in case you didn't know, this is the eighth annual Epilepsy Awareness Day Expo. Hopefully you're in the right place. Okay, so one of the things that are the main objectives today that I wanna to try to get through are number one, to understand the differences between THC and CBD, both their effects on humans who do or do not have epilepsy, plus what we know about their effects on epilepsy. Um, the different sources of marijuana for medical purposes. So for example, the FDA approved drug, uh, dispensaries, what you get off the internet and how to sort of think about what you're getting. Um, then for the FDA approved drug, what are the indications and a little bit about some of those uh, uh, approved indications like Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome. And actually the newest one is tuberous sclerosis. I'm just gonna mention a little bit about those syndromes so that if people, so that people know what they are and then you know what the data are for the drug. And I just want as a, um, sort of a complete open um, statement. I participated in the studies on CBD and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome through GW, which is a company that first developed that, that drug. And I do still consult for them trying to help design clinical trials. Okay, so um, unless you've been hidden away somewhere, you probably see five ads a day on CBD coming from somewhere. This was one of my favorite ones. This was CBD containing coffee uh, that was in some website that I was on. And it says here, you, it works for chronic pain, arthritis, inflammation, diabetes, PTSD, anxiety, sleep disorders, dementia, and so much more. Um, and actually there's very little data about any of those uh, in terms of what CBD really does for them. So what about marijuana for epilepsy? So it really started with a small series of patients and individual patient reports in kids with Dravet syndrome. And I'll talk a little bit about Dravet later, but it's a very severe, very intense um, syndrome in children, usually uh, before the age of one or two. The other big problem with Dravet is a lot of the standard anti-epileptic drugs can make children with Dravet syndrome seizures worse. So this is a really tough syndrome and obviously people have been looking for treatments for Dravet for a really long time. So between 2007 and 2010 roughly, there were um, some reports that suggested high CBD marijuana may improve seizures. Um, and then the, the sort of the, the big media change in 2013 was when CNN and Sanjay Gupta went to Colorado to interview people who had taken medical marijuana or high CBD marijuana to, and talk to some of these kids and did um, a, a big show on, um, on medical marijuana because he had done a previous show, Medical Marijuana, several years before where he sort of said, it doesn't look like it works for anything. Um, but then he came back in 2013 uh, on the, actually and talked about um, the late Charlotte Fiki 
and uh, that really sort of set things off. So then a lot of, at the time, Colorado was one of the few places in the country that had uh, recreational marijuana. So you could get marijuana without any kind of just going to the dispensary. A number of people, including several actually from Cincinnati who spoke to me before they went, moved to Colorado. But then there were some reports, um, at least from Denver Children's Hospital, that some of these kids were not responding. This was certainly not a miracle drug and some were getting worse. But most of the time, the worsening was probably related to too quick a withdrawal of the standard seizure medicine. Then in about 2007, a company called GW, which actually specialized in medical marijuana for decades, several decades, and I'll talk to you about some of their other products, um, which is, has an affiliated company called Greenwich, which is the US company. So if you get uh, Epidiolex in the United States, you get it from Greenwich, but the original company was GW. But in any case, they started three big studies back in 2007. After about 10 years of studies, safety studies and all the things that FDA requires for any kind of a drug approval that it got submitted to FDA and it was approved um, as a drug in 2018 by FDA. Okay, so that's kind of the, the history of where it is. Now I'm gonna step back a little bit and try to and talk a little bit about what marijuana does on CBD and THC and the other derivatives. So. The main uh, and important idea is that, that there are sort of three sources of cannabinoids. And when we use the term cannabinoids, that means any of these things, THC, CBD, any of the compounds that are in cannabis. So there are actually endocannabinoids. There are uh, cannabinoid receptors in the brain and the brain produces chemicals that actually um, bind to those receptors. Then there's the one that everybody's familiar with, that's phytocannabinoids. So these are the plant-derived cannabinoids. And the main ones are THC and CBD, although there's, there's many, many other cannabinoid compounds in marijuana, but the main two that have been studied the most are THC and CBD. So there are a couple of other ones like cannabidivarin um, and other ones, and uh, there, there's some smaller studies on those. And then you can also synthesize some of these uh, cannabinoids. And the only one that's actually marketed right now is something called Marinol. That's a synthetic THC, and I'll talk to you that, about that in a few minutes. And that's actually approved for uh, anorexia, uh, well, appetite loss and stimulating appetite in people, originally people with AIDS, but it's also used in um, cancer. So again, uh, in, the, in the brain, all these compounds, most of them will bind to the endocannabinoid receptors. What's very interesting though, as I'll talk to you about later, is that CBD, pure CBD, does not actually bind to the known cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2 in the brain. So uh, that's kind of an interesting phenomenon and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. Okay. So the big thing is when people use medical marijuana or will use any of these cannabinoids, the two main compounds are doing different things. There's THC and there's CBD. So THC is what people have historically used marijuana for in terms of recreation. That's what produces a high. It can also be associated with some psychiatric side effects like paranoia. That happens in a small percent, but not uh, a negligible percent of people that do high doses of THC. As I mentioned, Marinol is the FDA approved product that people can use THC for, and it's typically used for appetite stimulation. And THC may or may not be critical for treating epilepsy. And I'll explain to you why that is. It's because, mostly because the main studies in epilepsy, the, the, the high, quality, rigorous clinical trials have all been done with high, super high CBD and, and Epidiolex, which really has almost no THC in it. CBD by itself doesn't produce the high. Um, and I have one slide I'll show you at the end where the, the, uh, the company did a very nice study, a placebo controlled trial study, blinded study, uh, demonstrating that there are no uh, 
that you don't get high from pure CBD. Uh, CBD appears to have minimal or no psychiatric effects. As I mentioned, it's a component of Epidiolex. And at least as far as we know now, at this point, it is a necessary component of epilepsy treatment for most of the people and based on the clinical trial data that we have. So Marinol is a marijuana derivative that's used for appetite and nausea. It's these little pills right there. Uh, the other name for it is dronabinol, and it's approved by the FDA to uh, treat appetite loss and severe nausea and AIDS uh, or with chemotherapy. And it's a schedule three, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the scheduling of these anti of these drugs. So schedule one is the highest, most restrictive schedule. So that's like LSD, heroin, uh, our schedule one, and currently marijuana, according to the DEA, the US DEA, is a Schedule One drug. So all marijuana products other than Epidiolex are currently Schedule One from the DEA's perspective. The synthetic THC, Marinol, is actually a Schedule Three because it's synthetic. So the DEA and the FDA looked at it like a new drug that was just synthesized, and then they put it through their testing and said, yes, it has some risk of, uh, of, of uh, abuse potential. And that's why they gave it schedule three. And as I'll explain to you in a few minutes, CBD Epidiolex, the purified CBD is now not scheduled. When it first came out, it was like four or five. I can't remember which one it was, but now it's not scheduled at all because the data that they submitted to DEA and FDA suggested it has no abuse potential. I'm going to skip that one. So um, this is uh, a, 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 a compound called Sativex. And this is one of the other um, drugs that GW um, markets around the world. This is an oral spray. And it's approved in many different European countries for spasticity in multiple sclerosis. They, there are ongoing trials in the United States right now. But it's interesting because it's a spray. You just kind of squirt it in your mouth. Um, and it's a mixture of THC and CBD because one of the other indications, or at least places where studies have demonstrated some efficacy, mostly for THC, is in spasticity and multiple sclerosis. And so that's why this, this product is out uh, in Europe. And again, this is the same company that makes Epidiolex, as I said, the, uh, the GW had a long history. Actually, the company was founded to try to look in a really rigorous way for um, uses and ways to uh, use a cannabinoid and medical marijuana products. So Epidiolex, as I mentioned, it, uh, it's a plant-based, so it's, um, it's not synthetic. So they grow high CBD plants extract the marijuana as an oil, and then they put it through um, uh, this purification process that essentially removes almost all the THC. I mean, I think if you send it to a lab and say, is there any measurable THC in here, you might find tiny bits of it, but really there's not enough THC to give um, a significant effect. As I mentioned, it was originally Schedule One. Once it was approved by FDA and scheduled for DEA, it got down scheduled, and now it's not scheduled at all. So it's um, less, even less restrictive. Kind of surprising that CBD is actually less restrictive than, say, for example, lorazepam, Ativan, or even many of the different anti-epileptic drugs that we use regularly. This formulation, it's in this a bottle just like this. This, this is actually one of the study bottles, um, but it's in oil and it's squirted into the mouth. It's 98% pure CBD and there's no THC in it. So you, you put it into the syringe and you squirt it in the mouth and it go, you measure it by milliliters. And the concentration is about 100 milligrams per cc. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. That's one of the biggest concerns that as physicians we have about people who take different kinds of CBD from different um, uh, origins is you don't always know exactly the dosing um, or the concentration of CBD. Sometimes you do, some of them use good labs, 
but uh, not all of them do. Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit to the two uh, syndromes that CBD in the United States is approved for, and one is called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. It's an uncommon syndrome, but there's plenty of patients, people out there with it. It has many different types of seizures and they typically start in childhood, usually before the age of four. The name comes from two famous epilepsy specialists in the early 1900s, uh, Lennox, who was a British guy, and Gastaut, Henri Gastaut, who was French. Typically, they have different types of seizures, drop seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, something called atypical absence, which are long staring spells. Um, but the seizures are typically very frequent and hard to control. Um, most patients, but not everybody, has some degree of developmental delay, also known as intellectual disability. And the characteristic feature is uh, from, the e from the doctor, the EEG point of view, is that the EEG typically shows what's called a slow spike wave. So there's spike and wave discharges on the EEG at usually 2.5 cycles per second or less. That's important because other kinds of epilepsy that have generalized spike wave may have, like the typical spike wave is three hertz, three cycles per second. Another syndrome called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy typically has an EEG that's faster, that's four to five hertz spike and wave. One of the other things though, is if you're, if you're a patient with Lennox Gastaut and you're 30 years old, your EEG may have shown this slow spike wave when you were 10 or eight or seven years old, but the EEG may change over time. So especially as people with Lennox Gastaut get older, they may not show this slow spike wave anymore. So again, if a person shows up to the neurologist or maybe for the first time sees an epilepsy specialist um, at the age of 30, their EEG may not still show slow spike wave, but um, usually that's why we try to dig into the records and get either copies or reports of old EEGs so that we can determine whether that slow spike wave was there. But the other thing about Lennox Gastaut is it's not a really specific um, syndrome. Uh, lots of different problems in the brain, including things like early encephalitis, uh, tuberous sclerosis, um, maybe uh, some people who have multiple cortical dysplasias. Those are very different brain problems, but from the seizure perspective, they produce a syndrome that may look like this, may have slow spike waves, some degree of developmental delay, and multiple different seizure types. So again, Lennox Gastaut, it's kind of important because it helps us figure out which drugs might work or not work, but it's not very specific as to the underlying etiology of the, uh, the seizures themselves. Now this differs a little bit from Dravet syndrome. So Dravet syndrome is even more rare than Lennox-Gastaut. It develops in children usually before the age of one. The common presentation is the seizures start in the setting of fever, but then the seizures just start happening anytime with fever or without. The seizures gradually become more frequent and some of these children can have hundreds of seizures per week or more. Um, and they're associated with what appears to be a progressive developmental delay. This is a whole different um, area, but if somebody has questions, we can talk about it later. So it's unclear if the developmental delay is caused by the seizures themselves or the syndrome or some combination. So in other words, you know, people who have more seizures than others don't necessarily have a worse developmental delay, but most people believe that the seizures have some, uh, some responsibility for the developmental delay. The other thing um, about the well-characterized cases of Dravet is about 80% of these children have a specific genetic defect in the sodium channels. And that's in the neurons in the brain, the nerve cells in the brain, all different kinds of um, sodium, potassium, chloride come in and out of the cell to balance the electrical activity of the cell. Children, Eight, about 80% of the children who have Drave have a genetic defect in those sodium channels, those channels that let sodium in and out of the cell. 
And that may relate to the last point on this slide, which is that some seizure medications can worsen seizures in Dravet. Usually the ones that worsen are the ones that affect the sodium channels. So drugs that affect sodium channels are very common, like in probably 50% of the drugs that we use for epilepsy have at least some effect on sodium channels. So again, that's thought to be the connection there is abnormal sodium channels and then drugs that work on the sodium channels have a, a disproportionate or unusual effect in, in these children with Dravet. So um, in the Epidiolex study, I'm gonna walk through how the study was done. You know, I think one to show how much work it takes to do clinical trials in epilepsy, but also to help you understand how we use the data out of these clinical trials to inform how we treat patients. So this was, um, there were two different, actually multiple different studies, but two different groups. There, was, there were two different studies in lennox Gesto and one study in Dravet. And I was involved in the lennox Gesto study because I'm, I, which I didn't say before, I'm an adult epilepsy specialist. I mean, I've treated some children, but we have a big epilepsy program at Cincinnati Children's right next door, run by Tracy Glauser and several other really excellent people. So they, you know, I, they do most of the pediatric epilepsy and myself and my group do most of the adult epilepsy for this region. So anyway, we were involved in the lennox gesto syndrome study in people with LGS that were 18 years of age and older. In any case, in this study, just to get in, you had to have at least eight seizures a month and the average person who was in there had 40 seizures a month. So these were pretty severely affected people where multiple different medicines didn't, didn't help, didn't change that. And then all three, there were three different groups. All three groups stayed on the medicine that they were taking before. And then it's what's called an add-on trial. So one group got placebo, one group got the Epidiolex at 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. And another group got Epidiolex at 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. And, all, and the placebo looked just like all three treatments were the same. They all came in those little bottles and the doctors and the patients, nobody knew which of the three groups that you were in during the double blind. Then that double blind went for about 12 weeks. At the end of that 12 weeks, which was the experimental period, then everybody got what's called open label. So you, everybody could get the Epidiolex and the physicians and the patients could figure out exactly what the right dose was for them with Epidiolex, which is sort of how we do it you know, now. But the FDA requires these kinds of studies, a double blind randomized trial to prove that a drug is effective in any area, epilepsy, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, hepatitis, whatever you want, this is, this is the standard approach that the FDA uses. So again, this is just a diagram showing the same thing. Patients with uncontrolled seizures, no change in their current medication, and they get, then get randomly assigned to either the 10 milligram per kilogram group, the 20 milligram per kilogram group, or placebo. Now, I point this out because in general, the doses that were used in this trial were pretty high and probably pr a little higher than we would target I have plenty of people who take 20 milligrams per kilogram per day of the CBD, but I don't, I don't get them to that in, um, you know, in four to six weeks. I it usually takes a little bit longer. But the point again here is the amount of CBD. So in this study, 10 milligrams per kilogram meant if the patient weighed 175 pounds, they would get 400 milligrams of CBD twice a day. So for example, as I was mentioning before, when a lot of the products that are out there, especially in health food stores and things, have really small amounts of CBD. Like when I, my patients come in, they say, oh, you know, Dr. Primatera, I, you know, I went to the, the, the health food store around the corner and I got this CBD oil uh, and I've been trying it for my epilepsy. And, and I say, okay, well, let me, let me see what you take. And so I can try to calculate out how much CBD you're getting. And some of these people may be getting 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams a day or twice a day. And I, and I said, wow, you know, in the study, somebody your size 
instead of three or four drop, you know, drops out of the dropper, you might be taking that whole bottle twice a day with the amount of CBD that's in there. So that's why I think it's really important for the physicians to work with patients and to make sure that if you're getting CBD or other kinds of marijuana from other places that you talk with your physician so that you can kind of figure out what the optimal dosing might be. And again, at, at 20, it was 800 milligrams twice a day, which is a pretty high dose. I don't have too many people who are taking CBD right now at that, at that level, you know, taking between 1,000 and 2,000 milligrams a day. So in the study, they wanted to measure how, how, many, uh, how the seizures were reduced, measure side effects, and measure levels of other medicine because this was kind of a surprise to us. Everybody, you know, nobody expected a lot of drug-drug interactions with it, but it turns out that high CBD actually has a fair amount of drug-drug interactions, especially with a drug called Clobazam, trade name is Onfi, where when you add CBD, Onfi levels and the metabolite of Onfi go up quite a bit. And the metabolite goes up about three times as high. And it may cause other side effects. So these, this is the sort of a, a summary of all those different studies that were done. Um, in the Drave study, the, the, the participants who got the drug had their seizures reduced by 39% on average, whereas the placebo group had theirs reduced by 13%. In the Lennox Gesto study, in one study, there was just one dose. In the other study, there were two different doses. And so what you see down here is that the seizures were reduced by 44, 42, or 37%, which is pretty good, especially in a refractory group in a, in a group of patients who had lots and lots of seizures and have failed multiple different medicines, um, th these are pretty good numbers. And then the placebo effect is pretty typical for people with, for studies of people with seizures. The most common side effects, uh, and I, I see, I think some questions went up and I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm not gonna just run through, I'm gonna try to hit the questions, but let me finish this slide and I'll try to get to some questions. So the most common side effects were somnolence or sleepiness, diarrhea, or decreased appetite. And, and the decreased appetite actually goes, goes to show you that it's very CBD is very different than THC because THC's indication is to increase appetite. And that, you know, that's sort of the source of the munchies that everybody used to talk about when people smoked pot. Uh, but those side effects look pretty similar. The other final point on this slide before I, I get to some questions um, is like I just said before, that that high dose of CBD of 20 milligrams per kilogram per day um, produced 12% dropouts and in another study, 6% dropouts. And then the lower dose only produced 1% dropout. Um, and what you can see is that you get a little bit more effectiveness, but not that much. So my view is that I like to start the epidiolex really low and then gradually move up to something around 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. But that may be over multiple weeks or months because I feel like if you go too fast, people drop out because they, they get a lot of these side effects. Okay, let me see if I can get up to the question chat area, uh -oh. it, keeps, it keeps appearing and then disappearing on me. Okay, so there are a couple of questions. So the first one was related to Epidiolex, what composes the other 2% besides the pure CBD? So the other 2% are some of these other things. There's a tiny bit of THC. There's probably uh, cannabidivarin and some of these other cannabinoid uh, compounds. And there's about five, at least, I think at one count, if you really just go down to really tiny amounts, there's something like 20, maybe 15 or 20 different cannabinoid related compounds that are in marijuana. So that's probably what the other 2% is. Um, 
The other question, if my daughter's seizures are controlled with medication, would you recommend in trying Epidiolex? We'd like to have her on a more natural option as opposed to a more harsh medication with side effects. Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, you know, in my view, what we, what we learned from this study is that CBD Epidiolex is kind of like a lot of other seizure medicines. Um, as I'll talk to you in a minute, there was about uh, overall throughout the study, a 13% incidence of liver problems, which again, we were pretty surprised because you know people have been using marijuana for years and it's not like we saw people you know, who smoke pot in the emergency room um, with liver problems. But as I'll show you in a couple of slides, the biggest risk factor was valproate. So if, if the patient or the child was on valproate and then you added CBD, there was about a 20% risk of having abnormal liver problems. So again, this is not, if some of you were around in, um, in the 1990s when Felbamate came out or when Valproate first came out and we saw people who had these really severe liver problems that uh, were uh, caused death in a substantial number. This was not what we saw. What we saw was liver abnormalities that typically reverse when you reduce the dose or in some cases you had to take the person off. So again, I, I think when you're using concentrated purified CBD at these kinds of concentrations, the side effect profile doesn't look that much different than a regular drug. And I still go back to say the key of what we wanna do is no seizures, no side effects. So if, you're, if the child is seizure free, not having side effects um, and monitoring liver function looks good, monitoring kidney function looks good, everything else looks good. I'm not sure that I would take the risk of trying CBD because it didn't work for everybody, that, that's for sure. Okay, I'm gonna hit a couple more questions here. Um, who could provide the best dosage advice for Epidiolex? Well, I, you know, um, there's a very, uh, very clear guidance in the prescribing information. So whatever physician is prescribing Epidiolex, usually I would suggest an epilepsy specialist. All, of, all the epilepsy specialists that I work with are very familiar with all the clinical trials and all the, the dosing and side effect data of Epidiolex. So um, any epilepsy specialist, I think would be my, you know, my answer. Okay, we've got another question. My 16 year old, nine years seizure free. Ooh and diagnosed ESES and partial complex epilepsy with ASD. Hmm. On lamotrigine, gabapentin, and amantadine, clean EEG 1.5 years ago, started at, uh, so ESES is electrical status epilepticus during sleep. It's a very severe um, epilepsy syndrome. So it's great that uh, nine years seizure free. Lamotrigine has a new cardiac arrhythmia warning. Tina's had Red feet off and on, concern about pot. Should I consider weaning and introducing Epidiolex? Complicated question. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, like I said, I think when things are going really well in epilepsy, my general rule is I try not to switch medicines. It's interesting, this Lamotrigine, um, I'm gonna hold off on it now so we can keep talking about it, but uh, I'm gonna come back to that because we've been talking about this a lot, this cardiac arrhythmia warning. Uh, with lamotrigine, but I think, uh, and we don't exactly know what to make of it yet, but I'll, I'll go back and talk about that um, at the end if we have a few minutes. Uh, so again, this was this is just a, an, a, another slide in there because after the original studies that I had in the previous slide, they did a study on tuberous sclerosis where again, seizures were cut in half and the adverse effect profile looked very similar to what we saw in the previous studies. So here's the side effects. And I, and I think that this really is the, the slide that has a lot of the information um, about why it's, it's not a super, I'm not saying it's not safe, but it's not hugely safer than many of the other seizure medicines or, or hugely or much better tolerated than a lot of the other seizure medicines. 
So in the study, when cannabidiol, CBD, was added to any other seizure medicine, the over about 16% of people reported sleepiness. But when the person was on clobazam, on feet, 46% of them reported sleepiness. And again, that's probably because of this drug-drug interaction where if you're on a stable dose of, of clobazam and you add CBD, the clobazam levels go up. So it's just like increasing the dose of the clobazam. Now, and then this is the liver function test. So what's called the ALT, which is the, it's a blood test, the main blood test that we use to measure liver. It's very sensitive. So if you have, for example, hepatitis or some other kind of liver problem, that ALT will just jump up really, really quickly. So um, in the overall group, it was 13%. But if, you, if the patient was on valproate, then the liver function, 21% incidence of liver uh, function. And about 22% had decreased appetite and about 20% had diarrhea. And again, these were much less. Now, 9% of the placebo group had diarrhea, which some people think is because the placebo group was actually getting the oil. Um, and some people think that at least some of the diarrhea related to epidiol X may be related to the fact that they're just drinking a lot of oil. So in other words, if you, if you decided to do, say, uh, three or four shots of, of uh, olive oil every day, you it might loosen your bowel. So that's kind of the idea behind the diarrhea. But there clearly seems to be some effect of the CBD on that too. So for liver function, these are the current guidelines that we're using. Before you start CBD, we draw a baseline liver function test, and then we repeat it at one month, three months, and six months. Um, if the person is on valproate, I, I might get it even more frequently than this. Um, and if there's a history of liver problems with other seizure medicines, I might get it a little bit more frequently than that. And then you can continue to monitor it ongoing, and that's really up to the, the, the you know, clinician's judgment, the physician or clinician's judgment. I wanna just review this quickly um, so that people really get an idea about these human abuse potential studies. So um, this was a, a study that the DEA requires with any drug that works in the brain. They say, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a group of uh, what are called recreational drug users. So these are people that have a lot of experience with lots of different drugs, usually marijuana, and many other drugs. And they volunteer, they probably, they get paid to do a study. And what they do in the study is they give these volunteers either placebo or some other, or other drugs, and then they give them the test drug too and they have to compare. So I will show you, and then they ask them questions about, do you like this? Did it make you feel high? Would you take this drug again, um, et cetera, to get, to get a gauge on if this drug was out there approved, would people try to be getting it from other people, selling it on the street, you know, robbing pharmacies? So they, the DEA wants to know all that. So this is the graph. It's a little hard to see. I tried to make it bigger and I, I, it, it's, it's all in little tiny pieces and I couldn't, I couldn't really do it. But to look at the graph here, this is sort of neutral. As, as the numbers go up, it means that person really liked it in terms of how it made them feel. And down here is uh, on the lower part is dislike. And this is the time is on the bottom. So they take the drug right at the beginning and then over the hours, they rate, oh yeah, I like this drug. Oh, I would take it again, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can see is they used three different doses of Epidiolex or CBD. The top dose was 4,500 milligrams. And remember I said before that 2000 is about the most that somebody can tolerate over multiple weeks. This was as a single dose they gave it to these people. And then they gave them alprazolam, Xanax, which is a Valium derivative, or dronabinol, which is THC, or a placebo. And for the THC and the alprazolam, that's where these graphs go up after a few hours where people said, yeah, you know, I feel pretty good on this. I like this. I, you know, I would do this again. 
But when they gave them CBD, even at the super high doses, they couldn't tell it from placebo. So this, I mean, this is kind of obvious. Everybody says, well, CBD doesn't really have any what are called psychotropic effects. But this was the first study to really demonstrate in a really rigorous placebo controlled way that that was actually true. Because there's still all kinds of, you know, I, I think um, I saw something online about Martha, an article about Martha Stewart, who's chilling out during the pandemic by taking CBD every day. And I said, well, if she's totally chilling out with CBD, either it's a placebo effect that she's getting or she's getting CBD that has THC in it because CBD does not make you chill out. Um, a lot of questions come up about what is hemp. So this is what hemp is. It, it, it's a, it, they are, there are particular strains of cannabis that have low THC and low CBD, and, that's, and they're labeled hemp. And historically, they're grown for fibrous material. Um, you can extract th some THC and you can extract CBD out of it, but you need a lot more. So it's not a high concentration. You need a lot more sort of plants to get the same amount of THC or CBD. But the, what's called the, the Agricultural Act of 2014, sometimes called the Farm Bill, says that uh, they, they wanted to preserve the legitimacy of industrial hemp. Um, and these plants have to have low THC and it should be used for research and pilot programs. But then for a while, the farm bill was used to legitimize CBD oil that was sold in many places as not being illegal. They said, oh, this isn't illegal because it comes from hemp. So the Department of Justice, which is where the DEA um, is under, kind of looked the other way about most of this. But technically, even if it says from hemp, if it has CBD, and it's in a store and it's being sold as CBD, from the DEA's perspective, that's still illegal. I, again, nobody's, you know, I, I mean, it may be like, uh, you know, going 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile zone, but I'm just telling you what the DEA rules are. And it, actually in Ohio, there are still lots of stores that have CBD products, but the Ohio Pharmacy Board said to pharmacies, if we see CBD on your shelves, we're going to shut down your pharmacy because we're allowed to, because they have to come in and you know they have to evaluate all the scheduled drugs. And so for the pharmacy board, from their perspective, any CBD containing compound is a schedule one drug. So they gave the warning. And, and in Ohio, you don't see any of these CBD items in uh, pharmacies anymore. And this is just to show you the hemp seed. There's lots of different things that they use. Protein powder, in fact, uh, I just saw that in the store yesterday of uh, hemp seed protein powder. The oil, can you can make varnish or paint out of it. And then the stalk is where they use the, the fiber. Um, and there's actually, you can weave clothes out of hemp stalks. Again, I, I talked about this a little bit. So the DEA scheduling uh, ranges from uh, schedule one, which means there's a proven indication to schedule five, which is the least dangerous, but some abuse potential and heroin, LSD, and marijuana are all schedule one, but actually meth and cocaine are schedule two because there are some studies demonstrating, at least early on in cocaine, it, it, it's a, an anesthetic agent. And as I mentioned, all, all other forms technically from the DEA's perspective are still schedule one. So when we think about what are you getting um, in the pharmacy or what are you getting when you go to the health food store, you wanna make sure number one, what's in the bottle? Um, is it susceptible contamination? Is it labeled correctly? What will it cost? And, you know, sometimes people are fooled and they say, oh, you know, I didn't want to buy this one thing. I got this other stuff really cheap, but you have to look just like any other drug. You want to see how many milligrams of CBD are in there. Um, and that comes up with the dispensary as I'll talk about in a minute in Ohio. And what's the standard of evidence that the products are held to? So you just want to know um, you know, how, how are they determining what's actually in the bottle? So in, in Ohio, in Cincinnati, where I am, uh, different sources of medical marijuana are, are very different. So the state of Ohio uh, has a, a approval for medical marijuana, uh, including epilepsy. I think there's 21 different diseases that it's approved for. 
Concentrations um, are probably pretty consistent. THC CBD ratio may be tested, but many of my patients who try to go to the, the state uh, dispensaries have said that they just don't have a lot of good products that are high CBD, low THC, and the purity is, is tested. When you order something off the internet, and there are hundreds of places you can do it, um, you know, it may be the same concentration each time, the ratio may be tested, it may be purity tested, but it probably doesn't have an expiration date. Um, and they may have much lower doses. Uh, this was several years ago, maybe three or four years ago, the DEA and the FDA actually went online and ordered 12 different CBD products that they found online and then brought them to their laboratory and analyzed them. Six out of the 12 products had zero CBD. So it's sort of caveat mTOR when you're on the internet, unless you're actually checking um, by an independent lab, you may be getting things that don't really have what the label says in terms of the amount of CBD. The advantage of having an FDA product is same concentration each time, you know what the ratio is. The FDA has these purity things. It has dating, so there are expiration dates um, and their doses are proven in the studies. But again, any pharmaceutical product is, tends to be more expensive. Although what I tell my patients sometimes is, you have to really look at how much are you paying for how many milligrams of CBD. It looks like the Epidiolex, if you buy it, if your insurance doesn't cover it, for example, it looks like if you buy Epidiolex, it's really expensive. But when you look at the number of milligrams of CBD, it's not that much more than what people are getting at some of the, of the, of the stores that I've seen, at least among my patients. Um, most states now have medical, some have recreational marijuana approved. Uh, this was a study that was in JAMA, what people are using it for. And the most common uses for medical marijuana were depression, cancer, lung disease, and heart disease. The, the shocker for me was lung disease. I mean, I think if you have lung disease and you're smoking marijuana, <laughs> I can't imagine why people would think that that would be um, a real benefit unless unless you obviously you have lung cancer, you're on chemotherapy and you're smoking marijuana to try to combat the nausea with the chemotherapy. But most people are still at that, for this survey, most people who responded to the survey are still smoking, 9% vape, 9% uh, eight, and some people would drink it as a, a liquid. And again, as, as of November, 2020, right now, on, the only epilepsy and only certain types of epilepsy are FDA approved for CBD use. Um, so the question here is, can I get Epidiolex for my epilepsy? And again, it's FDA approved for these three syndromes, lennox gesto Drave, and tuberous sclerosis. There are no rigorous studies on focal or generalized epilepsy. However, what we know is that other drugs that were initially approved for lennox gesto for example, Onfi or Clobazam, was initially approved only for Lennox Gesto, and it works in lots of different syndromes. So I'm not saying that we have data about it, but uh, I, I think most of us would be surprised if CBD didn't work in other types of epilepsy. But the problem is insurance companies may not always cover off-label prescribing. And usually for the first year, uh, they almost never cover it. But what I'd say now, I tell my patients, my batting average in getting insurance to cover Epidiolex for people that don't have Lennox Gesto um, is getting slightly better. I think I'm a little bit above 500 now. So I would say more than 50% of the people that I've prescribed Epidiolex for who don't have Lennox Gesto, so it would be off-label, insurance um, is paying for it. And just a quick comment so that you understand. The, the role of the FDA in making something off-label or on-label is not to regulate doctors. It's really to regulate the pharmaceutical industry. So FDA's role is to make sure that pharmaceutical industry is not making claims about their drug that they can't back up with data. But the FDA's role is not to regulate what a physician prescribes. So a physician, any drug that's approved 
any physician can prescribe it for any indication. I mean, you know, they may be doing the wrong thing. They may be, they may get sued for it, but that's not the FDA's role to regulate that. On the other hand, what we also see now is that insurance companies are very careful, especially at the beginning when a drug is first approved, looking at what's off-label and what's on-label for prescriptions. Uh, this is just real quick about Ohio, because there's probably not too many people from Ohio on, but if you are. So uh, as I mentioned, it's an approved condition. Like in many other states, you have to get cert uh, evaluated by a certified physician, then you get your state card and you bring that card to the dispensary. Um, although, and uh, state by state, one of my patients who uh, couldn't get his insurance company to cover Epidiolex and wanted to use CBD, he um, got one of the cards, but then said, wow, the, when I went to the dispensary in Ohio, there weren't very many options for high CBD and uh, there weren't uh, and it was really expensive. And he went to Michigan and surprisingly, there were a lot more products. And he said it, when he drove to Detroit and went to the dispensary in Michigan, it was about one fourth the price it was in the Ohio uh, dispensary. So I'm, I'm, I'll keep that there. Um, so just to summarize quickly, and we've left, I've left some time, we can um, do some more questions. Um, Again, CBD has been shown by multiple rigorous studies to reduce seizures. The doses in the studies were mostly higher than most people use. Uh, but like other seizure medicines, side effects were seen and there were liver problems in 13%. So this is not you know, a, uh, a medication with zero side effects. Um, and again, as I mentioned, purified CBD does not make people high. The big question that comes up a lot and this whole idea of, of do you need THC with CBD to really help seizures the most? That, that question has not been answered yet. So um, we know that CBD works to reduce seizures. The study of pure THC with seizures has not really been done or published at least. And no study has said, gee, you need, when you add THC to CBD, you get a better effect. Okay, so I think I saw some questions pop up in the chat. Oh, there we go. Okay, so if I have time, can I briefly address the Lamotrigine FDA drug alert? Yeah, okay. Um, so what the alert said is that in vitro, and this was not in people with epilepsy, but in the laboratory, when, um, I think it was in animals, when lamotrigine was added in a, a model of arrhythmias, it, it made a certain arrhythmias more likely. To be super cautious, the FDA then put the warning out saying that if patient has a history of arrhythmias um, and especially certain types, and I can't remember exactly which arrhythmia types they were, but I would think but the way I'm looking at it with my patients is if, if you don't have a history of cardiac arrhythmias, if you don't have a history of heart disease, if you don't have a family history of arrhythmias, I'm thinking that the risk of the arrhythmias with lamotrigine is really low. And especially if you failed other drugs and lamotrigine has worked for you and it's not giving any side effects, I think I would stick with lamotrigine. Um, I think the other possibility would be to do an EKG or a 24 hour, if there's any question, a 24 hour like Holter monitor to make sure that there's not any EKG abnormalities that are coming up in somebody who's taking Lamotrigine. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I don't think this is, at least for me, and again, um, I think everybody's different and, and it's hard to give advice for every single case. But I think from my perspective, if somebody didn't have a history of arrhythmias, didn't have a family history of arrhythmias, didn't have a history of heart disease, I'm not sure that I would recommend to withdraw the Lamotrigine at this point. Again, this is early. The warning just came out um, you know, last week or the week before. And we're now amongst our 
epilepsy team discussing it, you know, we're concerned, but I don't think any of us is, is running out to tell people that this is a really dangerous drug. So here's another question, it's an interesting one. Um, this is, uh, the writer says, my husband has been on Onfree for seven years. His doctor's trying to wean him off, but he's having breakthrough seizures. We added CBD that he takes two hours before his Onfee. Have you seen people take CBD to get off Onfee? And could we try to get his doctor to try Epidiolex? Uh, yeah, so there's kind of two parts to that question. The first part is, it's really hard to get off on fee. I mean, some people do it fine, um, but it because it's a benzodiazepine, you sometimes get the same kind of problem these with breakthrough seizures or withdrawal seizures. So sometimes you have to do it really, really slowly, but even going slowly doesn't help all that much. Um, adding CBD, not a bad idea. Uh, if the, but one of the things that may happen is when you add the CBD, you'll, you'll, two things will happen. So first, the CBD may be giving an anti-epileptic effect. So that's helping block the breakthrough seizures. But the second part is that if you give the dose high enough, what we saw in the studies is that CBD makes onfi levels go up. So if, if it's blocking seizures by make, by when you reduce the dose of onfi, but then you add the CBD and the onfi blood levels go up, you're kind of negating the reduction of the onfi. That's a complicated uh, interaction, but that might be having some effect. Um, and as far as epidiolex, I think if you're doing something like this, where you really need to titrate the doses precisely, and maybe you even want to measure onfi levels if, you're, if you've got a lot of CBD interactions, although that may not absolutely be necessary. Um, I personally would, on this one, where you're really titrating really closely, I would prefer to use Epidiolex just because I know exactly what I'm getting. And I, you know, I know how to titrate those doses, you know, from 200 milligrams, the difference between 50 milligrams a day, 100 milligrams a day, and 200 milligrams a day. I know with Epidiolex, uh, I, pretty much how much exactly I'm, I'm getting. So, uh, the last question, or the, the most recent question is, so I'm joining a bit late, maybe you answered it. What, what milligram should I take to help seizures? So in, in the study for CBD, the two doses that were used were 10 milligrams per kilogram. So um, exa the example I gave was for a, a 175 pound person, that would be about 400 milligrams twice a day. Um, the other dose that was in the trials was 20 milligrams per kilogram per day, but that's kind of a pretty, that's a higher dose. Um, and is THC smoking weed bad for epilepsy? Well, nobody really knows because the studies haven't been done. Um, it could be that THC doesn't do anything bad for you. Um, it could be that THC isn't so good, but it's being counterbalanced by the CBD. So we know that CBD helps seizures. What we don't know is really whether THC helps seizures. All right, so I think I'm pretty close to the end of the hour. Yes, oh, thank okay. you, Dr. Privatera. Okay. <laughs> I'm one of the volunteers, I just jumped on. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for your presentation, your time this morning. Sure. And um, yes. Yeah, my pleasure, and, and, uh, and I'm happy to be able to participate. This is such a wonderful um, program that, that you have going, and, uh, and I just wish everybody the best of luck in you or your family member or loved one getting the seizures under control. It is not the easiest thing to do, um, but remember, you, you got to keep working at it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Provotera. Thank you.